those kind of comments. Okay, just before we start the meeting in full, uh, just to inform members of the change of date for the Policy and Resources Committee, which is scheduled to be held on the 17th of December, which is now being changed to a full authority meeting. Okay, any apologies for absence? We have received apologies from Les Byron, who is attending at the Open Government Association Fire Commission. Any other apologies? Any declarations of interest for any items on the agenda? Uh, item number uh, 8. Uh, item 8. It's the Prescott uh, Fire Station. It is uh, in my ward. So I'm declaring an interest. Non pecuniary. And you're also a member of the Planning Committee. And I'm a member of the Planning Committee. item which is the pink paper which is included as part of item 8 um, and it just gives some financial background. If any members have any questions regarding that item um, please say so now uh, otherwise we can continue with the agenda and we don't have to uh, exclude any questions from So does anybody wish to raise any just on that pink paper or we have with that part? Okay. Okay, we go into the Agenda. Item 2 is the minutes from the previous meeting on the 30th of June. Can we do that as a correct record? Can I just say, Chair, that I was at that meeting on the 30th of June? Council Chair. Okay, okay. Just amend the minutes. Okay. 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 Item 3 is the minutes of the extraordinary meeting held on the 14th of July. <coughs> Item 4 is the minutes for the consultation and negotiation subcommittee on the 24th of March. Can we read them? Okay. Item 5 is the deputation on the allowance and expenses paid to council councillors uh, by Mr. Brace. Um, just to inform Mr. Brace that you have five minutes to speak on this subject um, and you need to ensure that you keep strictly to the Shall I use this microphone? Yeah, please. Earlier this year, on the 11th of June, the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority met. Agenda item 9, members' allowance payments, included a table of allowance and expense payments for councillors on the MFRA for the previous financial year 2014-15. The report that accompanied the table referred to the regulations. They require publication each year of the amounts paid out under the Members Allowance Scheme for each councillor in the categories of Basic Allowance, Special Responsibility Allowance, Dependents Carers Allowance, Travelling and Subsistence Allowance, and co Tees Allowance. However, the expenses in that table only included amounts claimed back by councillors through expense claims. That table did not include amounts where the MFRA was invoiced directly for travel and accommodation expenses rather than councillors being reimbursed. These amounts where FRA were invoiced directly total around £6,000. The regulations, however, require the table to include all payments made under the Members Allowance Scheme, irrespective of whether they are paid directly by MFRA or claimed back by councillors using <coughs> expense claims. The table of figures for allowances reported to the AGM on the 11th of June also didn't include the employer and national insurance costs of £10,151.59 paid on the allowances. Ultimately, councillors are accountable to people in Merseyside, so what reassurances can you give that the next time the figures are published for 2015-16, that they will reflect the actual cost of councillors' allowances and expenses? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gosh. I always 
understand that there's been um, a number of email exchanges between yourself and officers of the authority to explain to you the breakdown of the costs and how they've been calculated. Is that, is that correct? Yes, there have been emails between them. I also understand that this has been shared with the district auditor, is that correct? Uh, Grant Thornton, yes. Yeah. And I also understand that this has been approved as the, the way the uh, finances have been reported to the authority, it has been, has been fine, it's been, there has been an issue with that. They've accepted that the way that it's been calculated, the way it's been reported, the way it's been reported. They accept the note in the statement of accounts includes the amounts I've just referred to, yes.
whenever we can. Um, the, the, the strategy also talks about sustainable procurement and looking after the environment and everything that we do, trying to reduce waste and landfill, um, and of course, equality and diversity. Um, the policy members, which is um, on page 51, um, which, which is a, about social value, um, talks about what social value is. Um, but members, if I can just draw your attention um, to, um, first of all, page 53, um, under the policy explanation, um, that takes you through really some of the issues around this. Um, so it's about promoting um, employment, economic sustainability. Uh, this, because we have a shared procurement team across Merseyside Fire and Lancashire Fire and Rescue Service, uh, this is all about encouraging suppliers to adopt a living wage across these two areas, um, <coughs> wherever we possibly can. Clearly, you know, this, this is not something we can necessarily force people to do, but every contract should try to ensure that we promote this as far as we possibly can. Um, to promote participation, engagement, <coughs> um, and to look at building capacity in the voluntary and charitable sector, as well as the community sector. Um, as well, of course, again, as equality and fairness um, and environmental sustainability. Um, that that um, is a summary, Chair, of, of what this paper is about. However, if I can answer any questions, um, I will. Thanks, thanks very much for this. And I was really pleased to see on page 53 about the living wage aspects of this report. Uh, what I would like to ask you, and I haven't seen it anywhere, is can you stop contractors from doing zero hour contracts? From doing? Employ people on zero hour contracts. Could you have you any say in that? Um, unfortunately, it's not something we can actually prevent, although, again, whilst we're encouraging a living wage, that will be part of encouraging employers not to be offering zero-based, uh, zero-hours contracts to people. Um, the government uh, yesterday, um, as it happens, brought out um, some guidance for all employers in terms of how to use zero-hours contracts, situations where it's appropriate and situations where it isn't. Uh, and clearly we'll be taking full account of that guidance. Thanks, Chair. Um, two items. Um, first, on the policy explanation which, which, which it went on to, um, I was thinking of surely at a time when the contract is first put on for tender, uh, contract compliance itself is a very important issue at that point, and, and many of the things that I'm, I'm sure members and, and the public would, would want to happen would be a time when, when we can put them in. Um, that's just a comment to make. But the question I had is, is on page 50, um, on the continuous improvement. Um, it's, it's sort of the second, the second um, <coughs> line down, at times internal customers. Is it possible to strengthen that a little? Because I think it's a great idea because you've got to ask how, how something is working, and it's the people who are on the other side of it on many occasions. And I was just wondering if you could just sort of strengthen that a little from just at times. Um, <coughs> I'd, like to, I'd like us to have a situation where we know we're continuously talking to those who provide the services from uh, some of the contracts we're given out. They'll know better um, from that point of view. Um, yes, certainly we can, we can look at that and see if we can maybe use more words like encouragement than, than just looking at at times, so encouraging that to happen. Uh, page 54, please. Um, really welcome the fact that we're looking closely at um, recycling and what we do with our waste and the carbon footprint, etc. But I just wonder what kind of examples there would be for ethical sourcing for the fire authority. I, um, I think what that refers to is um, things like use of the living wage and use, use of. Um, labour where people are paid properly um, and where people are treated properly.
properly and anywhere, of course, where we would find out that that wasn't happening would be brought into the tender process. Thanks, Jen. Again, just on page 53, um, it does talk about in, um, near the end of the paragraph about the appropriate weighting in the tender evaluation. Is, is there a certain percentage or can you just explain and expand on that a little bit more? That there are different weightings applied to different aspects of every tender. Um, each one is looked at on its own merits um, and appropriate weighting is given to different things depending on what um, what we're buying uh, and what we're procuring. Um, and clearly, you know, cost is one of those, but um, a number of other issues can be brought into play. And, and basically, there's a lot of discussion goes on between um, the procurement team and the client department who wants to procure the particular thing, like what weighting they, they feel is most important to attach to different aspects of the contract. Um, back to the social value policies. Um, except that we encourage our um, contractors to, to pay the living wage. But we do know that some of the workers subcontracted out. Do we know that that same encouragement is being passed on to subcontractors to pay the living wage? Yes, certainly. Um, all of our contracts um, that are tendered um, put the same terms and conditions that we apply to anybody who we commission with uh, onto their same subcontractors. So any terms and conditions signed by anyone would apply to anyone that they subcontract and that's contained within every set of terms and conditions that we contract on. The purpose of this report is to request final approval from members to build a new station at Prescott <coughs> to replace the existing fire stations at Heighton and Western. Ostensibly, members, this is the go, no go decision in relation to the energy proposal. Back on the 6th of May of last year, members approved the proposal to merge the existing stations at Heighton and Western at a new station in Manchester Road. In, uh, in Prescott, subject to the outcomes of the 12-week public consultation process. The outcomes of that consultation process were reported to the authority on the 2nd of October of last year within report CFO 09414. At the same meeting, the authority approved the recommendations of report uh, uh, CFO 09514, which are the review produced at paragraph 6, which is on page 70 of the report. Um, what I'd like to do before we move on then is to just draw your attention please to the third bullet point of paragraph 6, uh, which outlines the estimated cost of the new build station at that time, which was £3.1 million. Pounds. I'll come back to that figure, which has increased to £5.3, just over £5.3 million, pounds, when I speak to the financial implications at the back end of the report. Um, members may recall the update on progress with the Prescott merger, which was contained within report CFO 02815, entitled Update on the on State Project, which was tabled at the Community, and, uh, Community Safety and Protection Committee on the 16th of April of this year. Paragraph 8 on page 70 details the authority's resolution from that committee. As members are aware, officers have engaged extensively with our emergency service partners over the possibility of creating a tri service facility at Prescott and indeed all of the stations which are subject to merging proposals. The next report on the agenda today is concerned with that very issue. The first pre plan application for Prescott was submitted to Mosley Metropolitan Water Council on the 26th of January, which was for a fire station only. This application was put on hold to fully explore the possibility of incorporating our police and MWAS colleagues within the development. Paragraphs 12 to 17 on page 71 detail the progress we've made with Merseyside Police and the Police Crime Commissioner in that regard. 
in summary, and as you can see from the, uh, the plans which Colin's provided there today for you to, uh, to peruse, I'll come back to that and, uh, at the back end of speaking to this report. Merseyside Police are going to collaborate with us and co-locate with us at Prescott, which is an excellent outcome and is also a testament to the strength of the relationship between both of our organisations. Paragraphs 18 to 25 on pages 70, um, 71 to 72 detail the extensive work that was undertaken with the North West Ambulance Service. Unfortunately, as we see from the report, we were advised by MWAS on the 18th of June that they no longer wished to proceed with a co-location at the site. Paragraphs 24 and 25 explain the consequences of that decision, um, not least of which is the significant delay in us having made progress up to this point. Uh, clearly, that's been very disappointed, but that is it. the decision is made and we need to move on now with the build. Paragraphs 26 to 32 detail the negotiation we undertake with our colleagues in Knowsley over the land at Manchester Road. The decision of North West Ambulance Service to withdraw from the project has had an impact on the amount of land required, which, uh, which is for obvious reasons. Contrary to the narrative of page 32, Colin has managed to get hold of some plans for the meeting today, which will be available for you to view. Uh, over there on the, uh, which is all to your right up on the partition wall, which is in addition to the elevation drawings which are provided in Appendix A for indicative purposes. Paragraph 33 details the timetable, which, all being well, it would see a joint police and fire station operational by March of 2017. Uh, to conclude, members, I need to draw your attention to the financial implications which are set out in paragraphs 39 through 47 on pages 74 and 75 of the report. Paragraphs 41, 42 and 43 explain the reasons for the differential between the initial estimate of 3.1 million to the current estimate now of 5.35 million. Uh, again, that, that, that those reasons are self explanatory so we'll speak to them in detail. At present, we're estimating the capital contribution of in the order of the £600,000 from Merseyside Police, in addition to the £1.7 million grant funding that we've already secured from DCLJ. Capital receipts for the existing fire stations at Height and Worcester are also anticipated. Right, for commercial reasons, we've not shared them at this time, or if they are on the pink paper. So we're not sharing them publicly for reasons again which would be self-evident. The well, in order to avoid borrowing them, the, the balance is going to be met from the capital reserve, which is that, that amount estimated to increase from what we initially estimated at 800,000 up to 2.38 million. The proposed changes to the capital programme as a result are summarised at the end of the day. Members, the recommendation of the report are listed at paragraph 2, back on page 69, which is what you're being asked to approve today. In essence, we are at the go-no-go no point in, uh, in this project. I am strongly recommending to your members that we approve the go option. I'll pause at that point here to take any uh, questions that members might have. Any questions or observations from members? If you look at paragraph 24, the, um, the, the last sentence that we just quote directly, officers are currently in discussion with MWAS over payments of cost directly attributable to their decision to withdraw from the programme. So please be assured, members, that uh, the Deputy Chief is, uh, is leading on that work. I don't need to attest to you the, the tenacity of the Deputy Chief in that regard. It is something that we will most certainly pursue. <coughs>
towards our beliefs. Uh, we do have uh, a joint committee of ourselves and the beliefs, which is which has gone on quite well, quite constructive. And I think with the financial pressures, as I've mentioned before, as well as the operational pressures, I think we need to look closely at how we uh, use our resources again, in all capacities. Um, but this is a good news story um, of part of the majors um, of our brand new state of the art uh, station. Members, the purpose of this report <coughs> is to propose a response from the Fire Rescue Authority to the Government consultation on the enabling closer work on between the emergency services, which was issued on the 11th of September. <coughs> the uh, DCLG um, Home Office and Department <coughs> for Health issued the consultation. Um, it arises from the Conservative Manifesto commitments to enable fire police services to work more closely together and to develop the role of elected and accountable police crime commissioners. The consultation consists of 16 questions. There are, some of the areas are directly um, specific to this side Fire and Rescue Authority. They're listed at the bullet points on uh, which is paragraph 5, page 4, top of page 4. New duty on all three emergency services to actively consider collaboration. Um, Power for PCCs to take on the duties and responsibilities of fire rescue authorities where the local case is made, and the creation of a single employer facilitating shared back office and streamline management, and for the police crime commissioners to have representation on fire and rescue authorities where authorities continue to exist. The consultation also proposes the abolition of LFIPA, which is the London Fire Emergency Planning Authority and to give the Mayor direct responsibility for the Fire Rescue Service within London, as will be the case in Greater Manchester under the, uh, the devolution arrangements. The responses to the consultation are due by the 23rd of October, which is Friday. Our consultation response is set out at Appendix A, uh, which I'm asking members to approve. Uh, at this point in time, it is not clear if or when the government will respond to the consultation, so we don't know um, any time scales for any response at this point in time. Uh, draw you back to Appendix A members, the, uh, the answers, or rather the responses to the 16 questions are there for you to consider, and uh, the recommendation is that you report you approve the response to be submitted by officers by the deadline on Friday. Yeah. Any questions for members of the document? Mm -hmm. no. just, just to say on this, obviously I went to a, a briefing that was organised by the DCLG uh, about two weeks ago. And um, you know, I wanted the confirmation from the civil servants and the council of the minister that this is just solely an enabling role <coughs> that it's not going to force through any proposed measures between ourselves or the PCC. And we were given that assurance at the time. And also with the conversations that we've had with the PCC, there's no intention of them once to take them and they got to take over. Um, so the response that will be put, um, that will go into the government, it is making that quite clear that we have no intention of uh, managing the PCC. And you'll see what's going on within the, um, the sort of cities and devolution bill and the, the recent consultation submission that we've put as part of the bid and the authority's response to that would be to be more aligned with the city region and metro mayor if there was to be one following some um, comments made over the last couple of days but it's fair to say that the, this government at this moment don't know where the fire rescue service sits in this, in this new world of devolution and devolved powers and finances which is a bit unstable shall I say for the service not just last five years we've had significant cuts to the service and significant pressures and with that everybody's looking over the shoulder of what's going to be cut next and what service is going to go, what jobs are going to go, what's going to be threat. Um, so with that as well as then being told you know, we could be taken over by a PCC, we could be taken over by a Metro Mayor, you know, everybody in John Copley. We are one of the most efficient and effective public service in the whole of the country. We do 
do or task those, we get on with the job where we are an agency service, we are a risk based service. I, I wish they just leave us alone and let us get on with the job. <laughs> so, with that, with saying that, can I ask for your approval for the consultation response to go to TCLG? Is that agreed? Really? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. That concludes the presentation. <coughs> I thought if we did have a training session, that members would take a hand. Our staff engagement at our next meeting with the authority will be the 17th of uh, December. But just before we leave, sorry, um, if I could ask Nick, Nick Pitchers, who's been with the authority for about three years or so now, um, and as part of the Committee of Member Services, and Nick has served well, uh, done a fantastic job on our behalf, and I'm sure you've enjoyed your time while you've been here. Nick has moved on to a uh, new future, a uh, new job. Uh, We'll be sorely missed, uh, but we wish to thank you and we've, uh, we've got a little something for you to, to give to you as a bit of appreciation.